All right, so, uh, so what we are uh, discussing is the Schwarz lemma, okay, which uh, where we are looking at a function f which is defined on the unit disc and it is taking values in the closure of the unit disc, okay, and we assume that uh, it maps 0 to 0, okay. Then the Schwarz lemma says that the uh, if you take any complex number z in the unit disc, then the modulus of its image cannot exceed the modulus of the uh, the modulus of the image of that complex number under f cannot exceed the modulus of the complex number okay so uh, and the fact is that you get equality uh, even at one uh, value if and only if it's a rotation okay and uh, and, and and in which case uh, you get equality everywhere okay uh, and uh, and of course you know a rotation is uh, bilinear transformation and it will map uh, uh, the unit disc isomorphically onto the unit disc and it and it fixes the origin and a corollary to Schwarz lemma is that every uh, automorphism of the unit disc every holomorphic self map of the unit disc onto itself which is an isomorphism namely which has an inverse which is also holomorphic and which fixes the origin has to be a rotation okay. So, uh, now, so let us try to prove these things. So, the first thing is uh, uh, so let me prove uh, uh, Schwartz lemma. So, the, the, the idea of the proof is very easy actually, you are just going to apply the maximum principle and nothing else, okay. So, what you do is put uh, g of z is equal to fz by z put g of z is equal to f z by z uh, for z not equal to 0 okay because I am dividing by z I should put z not equal to 0. Then but the beautiful thing is that uh, uh, of course uh, g is analytic uh, on uh, the punctured unit disc namely uh, if z is not 0 then fz by ez is also analytic because numerator is fz which is analytic denominator is z which is analytic and you know the quotient of analytic functions is, is analytic wherever the denominator does not vanish okay. Therefore, this g as I have defined is it, it as I have defined it is analytic on the punctured unit disc. But the fact is it is even analytic at the origin the reason is because f of 0 equal to 0 okay. So, you see f of z if you write the power series if you write the power series of f of z centered at 0 namely the Taylor expansion of f of z okay. So, what you will get the, the Taylor expansion of f of z at z equal to 0 which is uh, you know classically called the Maclaurin expansion Exp the Taylor expansion at 0 is called the Maclaurin expansion. So, the Maclaurin expansion is what it is just f of z is equal to you know f of 0 plus z f dash of 0 plus z squared by factorial 2 f double dash of 0 and so on this is what it is this is the Taylor expansion. But what is f of 0 f of 0 is 0 because f is supposed to fix the origin it, it maps 0 to 0. So, what I will get is I will get z f dash of 0 plus z squared by factorial 2 f double dash of 0 where H z is analytic on delta on the unit disc. Why is H z Z analytic? Because you know H z will have uh, H z will have this power series expansion that is gotten by taking this power series expansion and you divide it by z okay. Namely H of z will be f dash of 0 plus e z by factorial 2 f double dash of 0 and so on and that will be a convergent power series okay. Uh, so, uh, H z 
is given by convergent power series at the origin so it is analytic at the origin alright but on the other hand outside the origin h of z is actually f of z by z okay so what you are saying is this function g of z extends to an analytic function h z at the origin in other words g of z itself is an analytic function in the or at, at the origin okay so uh, as h of z is equal to g of z for z not equal to 0 this shows that uh, actually 0 is a removable singularity for g of z okay see g of z is like sin z by z g of z is like sin z by z which a priori, a priori cannot be defined at z equal to 0 because as I said in the denominator but actually if you write it as a power series sin z by z is also defined at z equal to 0 because at 0 it has a limit okay it has a finite limit. So uh, Riemann's removable singularity theorem says that if you have uh, if a function at a point where it is not defined uh, but uh, suppose there is a function which is analytic in a deleted neighbourhood of a point okay then it can be extended to an analytic function at that point if one of the following three conditions satisfied are satisfied is satisfied namely the first condition is that if it tends to a limit as uh, as you tend to that point the second condition is that if the function is bounded in a deleted neighborhood of that point and of course the third thing is if the function has uh, 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 the function can be extended uh, uh, it has a power series expansion at that point okay and in fact uh, all the three are happening here okay. So uh, g of z uh, is analytic on on the whole unit disc. So you know I will keep writing fz by hz I mean I will simply write uh, gz is equal to fz by z and just remember that this is the expression for g when z is not equal to 0 when z is equal to 0 it is actually h okay and h is actually the power series uh, expansion of g at the origin. At, at and origin is a removable singularity so it is a uh, it is a point to which g can be extended analytically okay. So uh, well fine so after that remark what we do next is uh, now we we are in a position to apply uh, the maximum principle okay. So what you will do what we will do is the following thing. Um, So what you are going to do is you are going to take this uh, you going to take this disc this is the unit disc and uh, so I have this function g uh, which which is going from the unit disc what I am going to do is I am going to take circle uh, centred at the origin radius r, small r okay. So, uh, and I am going to look at uh, the function uh, uh, g of z which is uh, which is fz by z alright and I am going to look at what its modulus is on the circle okay. So on mod z is equal to r which is less than 1 okay so I am I am looking at all the points on a circle centered at the origin radius 1 radius r small r where r is a fraction okay what is mod gz mod gz is mod fz by z because mod z is equal to r and r is positive okay so uh, uh, certainly z is not 0 and g has the expression f of z by z when z is not 0 and uh, if I calculate mod g I am going to get uh, mod fz by mo mod z and that is well that is less than or equal to 1 by r because mod fz uh, is always less than or equal to 1 is something that is given to me that is just uh, uh, analytic expression for the geometric fact that f takes values in the closed unit disc okay. And mod z is e, mod z is equal to r is already uh, assumed because I am I am estimating 
the uh, mod gz on the circle where mod z is equal to r so I get this if you take uh, mod z less than or equal to r uh, mod z less than or equal to r if you take this closed disc centered at 0 radius r including the boundary okay and if you look at the function gz it is analytic there okay the maximum principle will tell you that its modulus will be maximum on the boundary. So here is where I am applying the maximum principle so on mod z less than or equal to r uh, mod gz uh, has maxima on mod z is equal to r okay but on mod z is equal to r mod gz is less than or equal to 1 by r and therefore maximum principle will tell you that on this whole disc mod gz is less than or equal to 1 by r. So the upshot is on this whole closed disc on here what you are getting is mod gz is less than or equal to 1 by r. I mean see you, the the point is you make an estimate of mod gz on the boundary of that closed disc which is mod z equal to r and that will also be an upper bound for the values inside because this is the maximum principle the maximum principle tells you that the mod will attain its maximum only on the boundary. So if you know a bound for the function on the boundary that bound will also be a bound for the function values on the interior and of course the function in this case is the modulus of the analytic function okay. So uh, by the maximum principle okay so you know when in applying maximum the maximum principle I am I am using the fact that you see g is analytic and therefore harmonic because g is analytic means that both its real and imaginary parts are harmonic and therefore g is also harmonic and I am using the maximum principle for harmonic functions okay. So it applies to g so mod g has a maximum on mod z equal to r but on mod z is equal to r it is bounded by 1 by r therefore 1 by r is a bound for g on the whole closed disc okay. So uh, for mod z less than or equal to r mod g z is less than or equal to 1 by r this is what you get now what you do is that you take the limit as r tends to 1 minus okay if you you take the limit as r tends to 1 minus we get uh, uh, mod gz is strictly less than is less than or equal to 1 for uh, mod z less than So and mod gz less than or equal to 1 uh, uh, will tell you that mod fz by z is less than or equal to 1 and that translates to mod fz less than or equal to z uh, for mod z less than 1 which is the first assertion in the Schwarz lemma okay. So, so this implies so you get this. Of course you know uh, uh, there is a little bit of trouble at z equal to 0 but at z equal to 0 this holds because uh, mod f uh, mod f 0 is 0 and uh, uh, of course here I have to put mod mod f 0 is 0 which is equal to mod 0 further let uh, uh, z not uh, be such that mod z0 system 1 uh, I will of course need f z0 not equal to 0 and mod f of z0 is equal to mod z0 okay. So in this statement uh, I should correct myself uh, uh, so z0 should be non zero okay because if I do not put that condition then this this is always true for z0 equal to 0. So z0 should be non zero. So uh, so suppose there is an z0 which is not zero where mod f z0 is equal to mod z0 okay. So then uh, what you are going to get is that you are going to get uh, then uh, mod g z0 is going to become equal to 1 okay because after all z0 is not zero so mod g uh, I mean g z0 is just f z0 by z0 
and mod g z0 will be mod f z0 by mod z0 and that will be 1 okay. But then again uh, you apply the maximum principle to mod g okay that will tell you that mod g will always be equal it will tell you that g has to be constant okay. So uh, because mod g can attain its maximum only on the boundary of the unit disc it can provided it extends to the boundary of the unit disc. If it does not extend to the boundary of the unit disc it can never attain the maximum. So uh, whereas mod g is bounded by 1 mod g is bounded by 1. So the maximum value 1 cannot be attained in the interior if it is attained in the interior then g has to be a constant this is the maximum principle okay. So, so by the maximum principle g is a constant so uh, uh, and uh, with g is a constant and uh, mod g z0 uh, constant with modulus 1 So I will get uh, uh, so I will get g of z is equal to e power i alpha because a constant a complex number with constant uh, complex constant with modulus 1 has to be the form e to the i alpha and uh, that means that because g is f of z by z it will tell you that f of z is just e to the i alpha z. So it is a rotation okay. So that finishes the proof of the Schwarz lemma okay that finishes the proof, proof of the Schwarz lemma and I must again uh, point out that I had made earlier the mistake of not saying that Z0 is non zero okay that is important because if I did not say that then I already have mod F0 equal to 0 equal to mod 0. So, so this is the proof of the Schwarz lemma. Um, I mean, what the uh, what you must understand is that uh, the moment f is a rotation, then f becomes a bilinear transformation. Therefore, it is one to one also. It becomes a conformal isomorphism. Okay. So, what it what your Schwarz lemma actually says is that if you take a analytic function uh, from the unit disc into the unit disc, the closure of the unit disc which takes the origin to the origin then either it is a strict contraction in terms of length okay that is mod fz is strictly less than mod z for all z uh, with mod z less than 1 or it is a rotation okay. So, uh, uh, so let, let us uh, let us look at this corollary let us try to prove this corollary proof of corollary uh, so what I have to do is I will have to take a holomorphic automorphism of this which fixes the origin and I have to sh say that it is a rotation so let f from delta to delta be a holomorphic that is analytic isomorphism such with f of 0 equal to 0 okay. So you take a holomorphic isomorphism self isomorphism of the unit disc right. Now of course to f I can apply Schwarz lemma because condition of conditions for Schwarz lemma is that f should be analytic on the unit disc it should take values inside the closed unit disc in this case it is taking values in the unit disc itself and it is defined on the unit disc and it takes 0 to 0. So all the conditions Schwarz lemma are satisfied so uh, I can apply Schwarz lemma and I will get by Schwarz lemma f of z mod f z is less than or equal to mod z for all z with mod z uh, 
uh, strictly less than 1. I will I, I, I get this uh, by applying Schwarz lemma to f. But mind you what is given is that f is a holomorphic isomorphism which means f inverse is also like f, f inverse is also a holomorphic map from delta to delta and f inverse will also take 0 to 0 because f of 0 is 0, f inverse 0 will also be 0. So, I can also apply Schwarz lemma to f inverse ok. Since Schwarz lemma also applies to f inverse the f inverse mod f inverse of w is less than equal to mod w for all w with mod w less than I can apply Schwarz lemma to f inverse which is the inverse of f which uh, which is given to me to exist because f is given to be a holomorphic isomorphism which means f has an inverse and that inverse is also holomorphic ok. But then you put w equal to fz in this put w equal to fz in this will give you that mod z is less than or equal to mod fz ok and then you compare these two opposite inequalities mod fz less than or equal to mod z mod z less than or equal to mod fz and you will get mod fz is equal to mod z ok and that is it that that should tell you that uh, that f is a rotation. So, mod fz is equal to mod z for all z with mod z less than 1, but we already see in the proof of the Schwarz lemma that whenever mod fz is equal to mod z holds for a single z0 different from the origin then f has to be a rotation. So, uh, here it is what you are getting is that it holds for all the, all the points on the unit disc ok you have more than what you need ok. So, this will imply again by uh, Schwarz lemma that f is a rotation. So, uh, that proves the fact that proves the corollary it says that the only holomorphic automorphisms of the unit disc that fix the origin they are all rotations ok fine. So, uh, having done this what I am going to uh, embark upon is to, to go into uh, a discussion of the Riemann mapping theorem which is something that I want to uh, whose proof which is is what I would like to discuss in the uh, coming lectures. It is a very deep theorem and uh, it in, it, the, the proof is not easy it involves several uh, facts and uh, so, uh, uh, but to make a preliminary discussion about it I wanted uh, this fact about uh, automorphisms of the unit disc. So, uh, let me, so let me start. Uh, with the Riemann mapping theorem which is what uh, uh, our long term goal in the next few lectures is a proof of the Riemann mapping theorem ok. So, the Riemann mapping theorem ok. So, this uh, so this is a theorem which says that you take any domain in the complex plane which is uh, simply connected and assume that it is not the whole complex plane then that domain can be uh, mapped by a holomorphic isomorphism out of the unit disc. So, in other words if you take simply connected domains in the complex plane and you go modulo holomorphic isomorphism you will get only a, a set containing two elements one will be the isomorphism class of the whole complex plane and the other will be the isomorphism class of the unit disc and mind you the unit disc is isomorphic to the upper half plane in fact it is so any disc is any disc is any open disc is uh, holomorphically isomorphic in into any open half plane because you can always find a Mobius transformation that will map the interior of a disc to any half plane ok. So, uh, geometrically uh, up to holomorphic isomorphism uh, unit disc is the same as a half plane any disc is like the unit disc 
all right any any finite disk it looks like a half plane that's one uh, that's one holomorphic isomorphism class the other holomorphic isomorphism class is the isomorphism class of the, of the whole complex plane and these are the only two holomorphic isomorphism classes of simply connected domains in the complex on the on, on, on the complex plane okay and that is the statement of the riemann mapping theorem so uh, so let me state that any simply connected domain d not not equal to c, to c so I am writing it also in words I also put it in symbols d is simply connected it is a proper domain the complex plane is holomorphically isomorphic isomorphic to the unit disk So this is the Riemann. This is the celebrated, famous Riemann mapping theorem, right? And uh, uh, so, in other words, what you're saying is that if you give me a simply connected domain which is different from the complex numbers, then there is a holomorphic isomorphism from D to delta, which is unit disk. Okay, and uh, that holomorphic isomorphism can be made, in fact, unique uh, in the following way. So let me explain that uh, in fact given is it not point of d a real number lambda greater than 0 there exists a unique holomorphic holomorphic is the same as analytic or conformal isomorphism f from d to delta with f of z not is equal to 0 f dash of z not is equal to lambda so uh, so the riemann mapping theorem says that uh, any simply connected domain uh, which is not the whole complex plane can be holomorphically mapped onto the unit disk and you can make that mapping unique if you fix a point if you if you require that a point of d a fixed point of d goes to the origin under this map and also that at that point the derivative of the map at that point is a fixed real number okay so these conditions uh, uh, make the map f uh, unique okay and it is uh, uh, so so you know there are two parts to this. this one part is to find a map f okay then uh, which is uh, which is rather the hard part the easier part is to say that once you have a map f like this it is it is unique and it is the uniqueness part that will use Schwarz's lemma okay or the corollary of Schwarz's lemma. So, uh, what I'll do is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll first try to uh, apply short sigma, which we have just seen, to show that you know if a map like that exists, it's unique. Such a map, uh, a map like that is called, uh, uh, is given a special name. It's called the Riemann map. It's called the Riemann map of the domain D. Okay, and the Riemann map is unique if you fix the value of a point on the domain. And the derivative at the, of the map at that point. Okay. Uh, I of course you, I have fixed the value of the point z not to be zero for convenience. And most people uh, or in several textbooks you would you will see that lambda is taken to be equal to one. Okay. But in principle you could take lambda to be any positive uh, real value. Okay. Now, uh, so let's let's first prove uniqueness. Suppose f1 and f2, f1 comma f2 from r uh, from d to delta are holomorphic isomorphisms. We 
with uh, with these conditions f1 of z0 is 0 this is also equal to f2 of z0 and derivative of f1 at z0 is a given lambda which is equal to the derivative of f2 at z0. I just want to show that f1 and f2 are one and the same map right. So what I do is that I compose f1 with uh, one of the fi's with the inverse of the other and realize that I get a conformal automorphism of the unit disc which by Schwartz lemma is a rotation uh, because it will fix the origin okay. So you see so the situation is like this so I have I have d I have delta I have f1 then I have f2 then I have delta here okay. So if I, if I go like this I will get the map which is f2 inverse followed by f1 okay and this f2 inverse followed by f1 uh, what is the property of this map this is holomorphic it is a holomorphic uh, map it is a holomorphic isomorphism because it is a composition of two holomorphic isomorphisms f1 is a holomorphic isomorphism and f2 is a holomorphic isomorphism though therefore f2 inverse is also a holomorphic isomorphism the inverse of a holomorphic the inverse of an isomorphism is always an isomorphism okay. So this is a composition of isomorphisms therefore this is also an isomorphism and uh, so this is uh, this is an isomorphism this is a holomorphic isomorphism and uh, where does 0 go to 0 goes to 0 because you see z0 under this map goes to 0 and under this map also goes to 0 so if I compose it I will get 0 goes to 0 alright. So it is a holomorphic isomorphism from delta to delta which fixes the origin and as we have seen just now seen as a corollary of Schwartz's lemma uh, this has to be a rotation okay. So by uh, corollary to Schwartz's lemma f1 circle f2 inverse of w is equal to uh, e power i alpha w it has to be a rotation of course whenever I write e power i alpha of course I am assuming alpha is real okay because if I write e power i alpha with alpha complex then it is uh, no longer uh, a rotation okay whenever I write e to the i alpha I am always assuming alpha is real. So uh, so this is because of the corollary to Schwarz's lemma okay and uh, you see you know if I calculate f1 circle f2 inverse uh, uh, so if I if I take the derivative of this okay if I take the derivative of this what I will get is that I will get f1 circle f2 inverse derivative at w is equal to derivative of e power i alpha at w which is e power i alpha. The, de the derivative with respect to w of e to the i alpha w is just e to the i alpha okay and on this side I will get derivative of this expression but then for this you apply the chain rule okay. So what you will get is you will get f1 dash of f2 inverse of w into f2 inverse f2 inverse dash of w is equal to e to the alpha okay this is just uh, applying the chain rule of differentiation all right and uh, uh, and mind you uh, in particular you know I, I can put uh, I can put any value for w here so uh, because this is an identity for all w so I can put w equal to 0 put w equal to 0 and what I will get I will get f1 dash of f2 inverse of 0 times f2 inverse dash of 0 is e to the i alpha this is what I will get okay. But then uh, you have to uh, remember that f2 inverse of 0 is actually 
uh, z0 because f2 of z0 is 0 okay and therefore uh, the uh, so you what you will get is you will get f1 dash of z0 f1 dash of z0 right into f2 inverse derivative at 0 is e to the i alpha okay. Now you see f1 dash z0 is given to be lambda so I will get lambda and the fact is uh, so let me write that separately okay. Now I claim that f2 inverse derivative at 0 is also uh, is, is equal to 1 by lambda okay that is just because uh, again uh, chain rule applied to f2 and f2 inverse okay. So f2 uh, circle f2 inverse of uh, uh, w is w okay and if you apply the chain rule you will get f2 dash of f2 inverse of w times f2 inverse dash w is equal to 1 okay you put w equal to 0 and you will get f2 dash of z0 into f2 inverse dash of dub of 0 is equal to 1 and this will tell you that f2 inverse dash of 0 is 1 by lambda okay mind you lambda is a lambda is a non it's a it's non zero it's positive and therefore you know well uh, if you if you look at both uh, what you will get is that you will get e to the i alpha is equal to 1 okay and once e to the i alpha is 1 uh, you will get f2 f1 circle f2 inverse w is equal to w and this will actually tell you that f1 equal to f2 So, uh, uh, so that so by using the uh, Schwarz's lemma, or rather the corollary of the Schwarz's lemma, namely that every automorphism of the unit disk that fixes the origin is a rotation, you are able to show that a Riemann map, uh, if it exists, which is specified at a point of the domain, at the simply connected domain, which is not equal to the complex plane, and it's. Uh, uh, if it's if it's image is specified at one point and its derivative at that point is specified, then the map is unique. The uniqueness comes from Schwarz's lemma, actually. Okay. Now, uh, so this is the easier part. This is the uniqueness of uh, this Riemann map. But now we have to prove the existence of the Riemann map. Okay. You have to show that there is a map from the uh, from the given simply connected domain, which is not the whole complex plane, to the unit disk. Okay, so let me uh, let me recall uh, dom uh, the 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 fact that the domain is simply connected is uh, by definition uh, it means that the any two uh, any any curve uh, any path in that domain starting at any point can be continuously shrunk to a point to that point. That means that there are no holes in that domain. Okay, if you think of it uh, as uh, in terms of the region that in that is enclosed by any closed curve in the domain then you do not want any holes there the domain should not contain any holes okay because if there is a hole then you cannot continuously shrink a closed curve to a point okay fine. So uh, it is very very important that you have the simple connectedness. So the question is how do I produce uh, how do I produce a, a holomorphic map from this domain to the unit disk okay which is an isomorphism. So the first step is you try to get hold of some holomorphic map which maps the domain into a subdomain of the unit disk okay. So let me explain to you the, the first step towards the proof of the Riemann mapping theorem namely the first step towards the proof of the existence of the Riemann map. 
In the first step what you do is you show that the domain D can be conformally that is isomorphically it can be mapped in onto a sub domain of the unit disc first of all you do that then you modify that map so that it can fill out the whole unit disc okay and I am saying it loosely modify means it is not just modify you will have to do a lot of things okay. But first of all given any simply connected domain how do I land at least into the unit disc. So uh, the, the beautiful point here is the uh, 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 existence of uh, uh, a logarithm for a non vanishing holomorphic function on, uh, on a simply connected domain that is uh, essentially used. So, so let me explain that. So, what I am going to do is uh, step 1. So, this is the existence of the Riemann map. So, I am going on with step 1 uh, find uh, holomorphic isomorphism H from D to H of D which is a subset of uh, the unit disc okay. So, the first step is to map first of all D into holomorphically isomorphically into a sub domain of the unit disc. So, what you do what we do is the following thing. So, so here we exploit all the uh, we exploit the fact that the domain is not the whole complex plane and the fact that the domain is simply connected okay. So, what we do is since uh, the domain is not the whole complex plane there exists it's neat or not complex number which is in uh, which is outside the domain okay. I can find such a complex number because uh, it is not uh, the domain is not the whole complex plane. So, there is something outside the domain which is in the complex plane okay. You take this we have uh, now now uh, the next thing that I am going to use is the fact that this domain is simply connected okay. The function z minus uh, uh, g of z is equal to z minus neta naught is non vanishing on uh, on d that is obvious because that because the point neta naught is not in d. So, z minus neta naught with z varying in d can never be 0. And since it is a non vanishing uh, function and it is of course analytic okay it is it is analytic function after all it is a translation it is translation by minus neta naught okay it is an analytic function. This analytic function uh, is non vanishing on this domain D which is simply connected therefore it has a logarithm okay. Since D is simply connected we have an analytic branch of log z minus neta naught on d okay and therefore the moment i have log z minus zeta naught i will have an analytic branch of the square root of z minus neta naught on d and my claim is that function <coughs> will do the job of mapping D uh, I, I can use that function carefully to map D onto a subdomain of the unit disc okay. So, let me write that and, and, and stop thus we have an analytic branch. of 
root of z minus theta naught as exponential of half log z minus theta naught on d. We can use this bran branch of root of z minus theta naught to get the holomorphic isomorphism okay. So I will stop here we will continue in the next lecture. So I am just trying to say that you are using a square root of z minus theta naught to get to map cleverly to map d first into a subdomain of the unit disc okay and the fact is that you are able to write this z minus theta naught because there is a theta naught which is outside your simply connected domain your simply that uses the fact the simply connected domain is not the whole complex plane and the and the fact that you have a analytic branch of the square root is because uses uh, it, it uses the fact that the domain d is simply connected okay. So I will stop here.